Cora TV. The world is thinking. Thank you. A lot of people have asked me all weekend long, am I going to perform musically? I'm not. I don't wish to be unfavorably compared to David Pogue. <laughs> let alone Josh Bell. So I won't be performing musically, but I'm going to talk about the business of music. Let's get the crash, crash self-promotion out of the way right away. This is my latest record. If you like in-your-face guitars and a guy screaming like he has his nuts caught in a Belgian waffle iron, then you may enjoy it. But this is not totally irrelevant because every time you release one of these things, I think second only to the, probably to the movie industry, you have to promote your buns off. You do marathon interviews and people ask you, sometimes interesting questions, sometimes really lazy questions like, what was your most memorable moment or what are you most proud of? And that only tells you that they never listen to the record and they don't have any idea who you are, what you're doing. They just ask that question to everyone. But a question that gets asked of me often and um, hasn't always been asked but has been asked recently because of um, more recent events you predicted everything that's happening in the music industry. What does the future hold for us? And I thought, should I um, continue to promulgate this myth that I am a prognosticator of some kind? Because in truth, I did not predict what was going to happen in the music industry. I more or less precursed what would happen in the music industry. I've been in it for 40 years, and it's... Uh, bear some uh, reminding that the music industry is not much more than a hundred or so years old. And I thought in order to properly answer such a question, uh, I would have to uh, perhaps refresh myself on the history of the music industry. So I went to the Wikipedias, and um, this is the sum and total of the history of the music industry, <laughs> according to Wikipedia. Three paragraphs, you notice the biggest one is just the last eight years. I thought that, no, this can't be quite right, but um, I recalled something and I went out and I went to YouTube and found it. This, I believe, is probably the seminal moment in the music industry. If, uh, if you would please play that little video clip we stole. Hello, hello, hello. Now, the thing that wasn't pointed out in that little piece of video, well, first of all, there's no music involved. But this was the point at which music, which had forever and always been a service, became a product. And this mythology has lasted as long as the recording industry has lasted until recently. So I'm not going to go through the entire recorded history of music. Uh, okay, we had Frank Sinatra, Elvis, Beatles... Uh, uh, Elvis, did I mention him? Okay. Caruso, whatever. And then, in 1979, Sony came out with this device here called the Walkman. And the distinction is probably blurred in everyone's mind, but previous to that, if you wanted a personalized listening experience, you had to do it in your own home. Possibly you had a cassette recorder that you could do mixtapes on and uh, mess around with the order of songs or take songs from different sources and turn them into one presentation. But previous to that, the music that you wanted to hear rarely left the home. This enabled you to take the music with you and the music began to adapt to people's um, lifestyles. Yeah, I'm sure she dressed this way. But in any case, this was uh, part of the uh, promotion for, uh, for the Sony Walkman in 1979. I never saw this particular yellow one, but um, it's a pretty hip unit. And I uh, began to 
deduce things, not at the time, but later, about how this had changed people's music listening habits and how they began to view, view music, how the impression of what the music industry was or what records were started to change. And this was something that was in control of the audience. Now, a couple of things happened. One of them I mentioned, the Sony Walkman, people started taking the music where they were, so the music became background to their lives, as opposed to them creating a special space to listen to music in. So the music was returning to its original purpose, which was a service. It was doing something for you. You weren't a slave to it. I began to deduce also that music was starting to break down in terms of its originality. In other words, at least in the realm of recorded music or in what music was being bought and traded, that there was recycling starting to happen. And, and probably the most significant example of that at the time was MC Hammer's Can't Touch This, which was actually a Rick James song, Recycled. And you probably don't remember you're lucky you don't remember, Frankie goes to Hollywood. And um, it didn't happen in this country, but in England they were such a phenomenon with this one song called Relax that every two weeks they would release a new mix of it. And that mix would sell and go to the top of the charts. So the recycling of music started to happen. The repurposing of music began to happen. That people were going to use it for different purposes than just listening to. It would be background to other activities in their lives. And so I got this concept, which I called No World Order, and happened to be in the right place at the right time. Because I was into music and because I was also into computers and computer programming, I wound up spending a lot of, I, as a matter of fact, I moved to California in the mid-80s so that I could enjoy my two passions, which were music and computers, and began going to all the Macworld conferences and things like that. But I made this deduction at a certain point that it was uh, technically possible for us to create a system that would allow users to completely tailor music to whatever it is that we were doing at the time and even do it in real time, to change it across real time. And so we came up with this concept called No World Order and um, I did little demonstrations around the country and eventually somebody stepped up and said, let's try and realize this, let's see if it's, it's uh, technically feasible whether it's uh, a real product of any kind. And that company was um, Philips. They had a device called a CDI and they needed new applications, thought music would be an important one, but how do we make it different than just simply playing a CD? So me and a friend of mine, Dave Levine, a, uh, a, one of these geniuses, so antisocial you would never see him at an event like this. But um, he and I devised a system by which you could Oh, there's a CDI box, by the way. I had somebody actually look at this and say, what is that? That's a Philips CDI box. No, they don't make them. It only lasted about three years, I guess, in terms of a format. But anyway, first thing I had to do was make music that would be adaptable to this particular concept. So I changed my ideas of composition and began to write music. While, while it might still be songs, they had to have discrete entry and exit points everywhere, somewhere musically within it. So broke the music down eventually after I recorded it into four, six, eight bar sections that were all broken down and turned into individual files. Those files were tagged in certain ways as to how many instruments were playing, whether the tempo was fast or slow, various sorts of information, nothing like what we have nowadays where things are completely genrefied, but um, the idea was to be able to give people control over the music in a number of vectors. One is that you could choose that thing program at the top. I took that thousand or so bunch of musical bits and the tool that I used to assemble them together and I gave it to four other record producers. Don was, um, Hal Wilner, Bob Clear Mountain and uh, Jerry Harrison from, uh, he produces records now, but he was in uh, Talking Heads. 